despite or in spite of all of that, you know, black folks still thinking out of the box, coming up with our amazing ideas. So the part that I want to end with is a couple of amazing stories because I, I just, I could actually talk to you for hours. Don't worry, it's not going to happen. <laughs> because I met so many amazing people. And even though I knew that they, it was out, they were out there, I was still surprised every single time. Brenda Palms Barber. Brenda Palms Barber is from, originally from Denver. She got a call a number of years ago from some folks in Chicago who said, we'd like you to come to Chicago and help us out. We have a lot of previously incarcerated black men and women. They come out of jail, they can't get a job. Maybe you could come up with a good idea. And she said, oh, okay, I can do that. And she said, when she got there, she was thinking of things like, well, they could do landscape gardening, maybe they could drive around the elderly, take folks to the grocery store. But none of these ideas seemed to be um, sustainable over the long term. And then she said she was in a conversation with a friend who just randomly was talking about beekeeping. And she went, that's it. <laughs> I would have previously incarcerated black men and women make urban honey on the west side of Chicago. <laughs> and you know some folks were like, uh-huh. <laughs> she got um, beekeepers to volunteer their time, and she got money to do it. Um, her company is called Sweet Beginnings. They make urban honey and honey-related products. They have a three-story house where they make their honey on the west side of Chicago, 25 apiaries in the backyard. Um, the honey, like, you know, stuff like lotions and stuff are made off-site. Um, her business is so popular now. One of the things I love about her story is that she says, as part of the, as part of moving previously incarcerated black men and women into a job, um, she has something called U-turn. This idea that you can always make a U-turn in your life. So you can make a choice, but actually you can come back from it. So she said when she interviews a young man, a woman, she'll say, I'm going to use you because I've used this guy to death. <laughs> Sorry, friend. Um, she said she'll sit him down to interview him, and she'll say, so you want a job? And he'll say yes. And she will say, um, and so you were in jail? And he'll say yes. And she'll say, so what were you in jail for? And he usually says, oh, you for selling drugs. And then she does what I like to call a dramatic pause. Were you good at it? <laughs> and usually he'll say, yeah, until I got caught. <laughs> and he said, well, what were you good at? And he'll say things like, well, I knew the quality of my product. I understood my customer base. And everything that he rattled off, she said, oh, all that stuff is transferable. Because for her, it wasn't simply about outreaching to him and giving him an opportunity, but wanting him to understand he had something to offer, right? That he could show up as his full self with that knowledge and just apply it in a different way. Uh, the, the, the recidivism rate in her company is so low, meaning that hardly any of those people who get hired in her company go back to jail, right? which is really incredible. About three or four years ago, they had me out, and one of these young men got up in front of the audience. There was maybe a hundred of us in the room, and he was in a suit, and he looked kind of uncomfortable, and he had his head sort of bent down, and he said, I never knew green could be so good to me, mm. which, you know, while I was in tears, everybody was in tears, <laughs> it was really beautiful. What Brenda said to me was that for, after a year, she was told she had a green business. She had no idea. She was doing everything by her own instinct and creative thinking. She wasn't feeding her bees sugar derivatives. She was acting locally. Right? She was drawing on African-American culture and history as well. And also, it was sustainable. And so now, you can look for her stuff online. Fabulous. Fabulous, honey. And because I had told them it was up here, Mm. Yeah, so here's the crazy story, right? No, I mean him today is so perfect because I talk about him in the book, but he's the only story I talk about in the book of someone I actually hadn't met. And right near the end, a few years ago, when his movie A Man Named Pearl was I'm going to be talking about you because I told you, I warned you in advance. <laughs> was that it was out in Berkeley. I heard about this. I was like, I gotta go, who's this man? How did I not know who he was? And I saw it, and I was like, oh my God, I have to talk about this. So it's been really, so I'm gonna just, it's hard for me because he's sitting here now and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I usually say, I totally forgot. Oh. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, that's true, though, it's kind of funny. So I can tell you my, what I got from hearing the story of Soul Fryer. Uh, you know, he confirmed everything that I had been thinking already about the idea of radical presence. I was really, um, that's kind of hard. You know, what you call today the, uh, um, not radical topiary, but um, abstract topiary. I love this story, this idea of what I understood when you and your wife decided you wanted to move to this neighborhood, Bishopville, 
um, the idea that you wanted to win that garden prize, that there was somehow this understanding of this rumor, this idea that black people don't keep their yards nice. And my understanding was he was like, I'm going to show them. <laughs> I love the idea that you didn't go out and buy a whole bunch of new plants and flowers, that you actually got the ones that were being thrown away in trees. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that kind of thought and that kind of intention, right, for me, is radical thinking. And then, a tree? You know what kind of commitment do you have to have to a tree to grow before you're going to carve it all up and do something fancy? That's a commitment over time, right, to the trees and bushes. And then just to bring your own vision to that, to take what he called junk and make art out of it, yes. um, just blew my mind. And just the idea that he doesn't follow the book, right? And he was telling me today, that's the quote I use, but it's like, I don't go by anybody else's book, I got my own book. And for me, we all have our own book. And sometimes it's not about the rules, it's not codified, it's not on the library shelf. And yeah, it's just like my biggest birthday program. Like, anyway, the last person I want to talk about, because if I have in the way of mouth, I'm embarrassed. Thank you. Is um, Tyree Guyton. Have any of you heard of the Heidelberg Project in Detroit, right? Yeah. So a couple of you have heard of it. Got a chance to meet, I heard about him, got a chance to meet Tyree Guyton. He's um, originally from Detroit for the last 25 or 30 years. As an artist, he said he saw, you know, Detroit people are moving out. They've got all kinds of challenges happening in Detroit. Lots of empty buildings. And he said, we're bothering all these empty buildings, partially because he said, you know, they're dangerous for people. But also there's something about you ignore those empty buildings, you're also ignoring the communities those buildings are in. You're ignoring the people who live in those communities, right? So he decided he was going to turn them into art projects and, and take also what he would call junk, too, things not being used. You know, old spaces, old yards. When I visited him and met him a couple of years ago, I don't, I don't think he got permission, excuse me, but this was, um, these are old projects that nobody's using. He was talking about a community garden and turning it into some big community art project and waiting to get permission from the city. And for me, one of the people who was uh, reviewing my book had said to me, well, why is he in there? He's not an environmentalist. And I just, you know, I felt like myself started to twitch. <laughs> but again, this is my thinking out of the box. Like, what, is, what does that mean? This man is looking at space, is looking at land, he's looking at community, he's looking at story, he's looking at ideas, it's about radical thinking. How are these things not part of a broader environmentalist way of thinking? And what does it mean to me that you can't see that? And I don't care if I put it in the book anyway. <laughs> so, we're almost at the end. So I want to come back to my parents, and this is part of the epilogue at the end, and I just love this picture by Gordon Parks. Um, um, so in 2003, 2004, my parents had moved down to the new house in Leesburg, and they, I was visiting them in about 2005, and they had gotten a letter, and when something happened on that property, what the neighbors do is send my parents an update, say they should know what's happening. So they had sent them this letter, and the letter is from the Westchester Land Trust, and it was addressed to all the members, neighbors of the community, and they said they want to thank the new owner for his conservation mindedness because a conservation easement had been placed upon that estate. What that means when a conservation easement is placed on an estate is that in perpetuity, nothing can be changed on that estate. They had determined it had high wildlife values in terms of all different kinds of birds and snapping turtles and deer on that property as well as the trees that were there as well, where that property sits in that particular watershed, all of these things were important. The letter was maybe about a page long, and again, was thanking this new owner. As I read that letter, I was like, where's the thanks to the people who cared for that land for 50 years? Mm -hmm. And again, it comes back to me, all the people that we don't thank, we don't recognize, we think are invisible, that we don't notice there. So the last thing I want to say is about the importance of taking risks. I just love this photo too. Um, the uh, The idea that I think we have to take a risk in terms of how we think about environmentalism, how we think about ourselves in relation to that, who we see and who we don't see, how we do our work, what are we complicit in, I mean, and risk, I mean, you could take a risk and it could not work out so good, so well for you, but I think that's what we have to do. I talk to um, predominantly white environmental organizations who have a lot of good people with a lot of good intentions. And so a few of the things that I say to them, I said, you know, first of all, I don't use the term outreach anymore, because outreach for me is about I get to outreach to you, I'm, a, I'm sorry, because I just like you. <laughs> I get to outreach to you how you do it. I bring you over to my table. Come on, you don't have to get up, that's all right. <laughs> I bring you over to my table, you learn how I do things, you fit in, so now I've outreached. I'm interested in a relationship of reciprocity. 
And what that means is I have to get to know who you are, what you have to bring. Maybe we don't even use my table, we create, we create a whole different kind of table. It means not only you tra have to transform, but I have to transform as well. Um, I tell, tell some of them that it may mean as leaders that you actually have to step aside because you don't have the capacity or the competency to do the work. And I know that's hard, and I say that with compassion because nobody wants to give up their place of power, but guess what? What is your larger intention? What is it that you're trying to change? What is the risk that you are willing to take? It's about building allies. It's about recognizing that all of us have blinders on. We all, nobody here knows everything, right? But somebody knows something that you don't know. So how do you work to create that space, right, so all of you can be in the room? And finally, two of my favorite quotes, and then I will stop talking until you ask me a question, and I'll talk some more. The first is from Albert Einstein. Now, you know, Albert Einstein was a smart dude. And he said, you can't solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. You can't solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. That's not, I mean, it sounds simple, but it's deep. Because it's not just about changing your practice. It's not just changing how you dress. It's, changing, it's about going deep, going deep within, doing a self-analysis with yourself, with your organization, with your university, with everything. And while I love that quote, I actually like how moms made me say it better. If you always do what you always did, you, you always, always get what you always got. got. <laughs> Thank you.